Let's stand and give honor to God's word as we read Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 22. Acts chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and a number of men, the number of men that came were about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning the good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that you rejected, the builders, which has been become a, the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them not to speak any more in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because the people because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. The man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Thank you. you may be seated. Again, we're going to give our little parental um, notification. We're going to watch a little video about things in Iraq that have been taking place um, with some of the turmoil uh, under ISIS. And there are some sensitive scenes that kids of certain ages may not be comfortable and Don Campbell is going to take the kids today downstairs so if you don't if you don't feel comfortable watching that with your kids and seeing that just want to let you know give you that warning and um, after the video is over they'll be back so uh, this is week two of IMN and today's theme is on courage How courageous is your faith? What would you be willing to endure to be, a, be known as a follower of Jesus Christ? Perhaps another question is, do you have a faith in Jesus Christ? Is your love and passion for Christ so strong that you wouldn't give that up for anything? It means everything to you. It has changed your life. Or are you in pursuit of just a religious experience in life because it's cultural, because it's American, because it's the way that things go for many people in society? I believe the days are coming when our faith will be tested very soon upon us whether we're willing to stand for the one we love and be willing to be persecuted for it. Where does the courage come from to stand for Jesus? 
the courage to stand for Jesus in a climate where persecuted Christians cannot live, a Christian's live cannot be based on human strength or emotion. You can't get it from being pumped up for the faith. Courage that encounters the fears and threats that Christians face in Iraq and Syria result from a total commitment to obediently serve God and to pursue His will in his, their life. Such commitment grows out of personal relationship with God. Not a religious experience. A personal relationship with God. The knowledge, the belief, and the experience that God reveals to be God that reveals God to be powerful, trustworthy in all of His promises. It's realizing that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. And we see this documented so clearly in the life of the early church. The witness to, to witness to the transformation of the disciples. Think about that. Prior to Jesus' death, during his death and after his death even, they're, they're locked up in a room in utter fear for their lives. Worried about the fact that the Romans would and the Jews would track them down and kill them. And 40 days later, 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, they are boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ in a hostile society. How do you account for that? Obviously, they embraced their Savior as buried, risen, crucified, buried, and risen again. That He was alive. That He, that he showed and He declared Himself to them. They, he revealed Himself to them. And they saw the, the, the nail prints in His hands and the spear in His side. They saw His feet. And they realized that Jesus had conquered death. He was alive. But you see that their personal commitment to Jesus was put to test. As great as the number of people were who responded to their message and their call to repent and to believe the good news of the gospel, an even larger and greater number stood to reject their teaching. The opposition was not so simple as expressing, well, we don't like what you're teaching or we disagree with what you're teaching. In many cases, the opposition was very hostile, it was very punitive, it was very intimidating. And we look at Acts chapter 4 this morning, we see modeled before us a create courageous Christianity. It wasn't, it was, it's not a soft, passive, ready to crumble in the face of adversity, ready to back down, ready to sort of cut and run when uh, times get tough. They didn't seek an easier road or any way that they could to blend in with their society and their culture so that no one would identify them as followers of Jesus Christ. And I certainly didn't see that on the screen. When everything was confident, they, they got on a road and walked. When they were given the options... Recant, pay us $50,000. Be killed or leave. They would not give up their Christianity. You could see that presented before that. I, I don't sense in courageous Christians a, a play it safe mentality. That is so fostered in our world today. It's all about play it safe. It's about self-preservation, isn't it? That's what we're kind of schooled to do in our society. Lay low. Don't anybody let anybody know really what you believe. Don't let anybody know why you go to church on Sunday. Don't let anybody know about this sort of secret relationship you have with Jesus Christ. But as I look at the early Christians... They set the pattern, the standard, the life for us to follow. They give us a basis for asking the question, how courageous is my expression of my love for Jesus Christ before others in this world? Can people really tell by your life and my life that I really love Jesus? 
that Jesus means everything to me. Can people tell, like they did in Acts chapter 4, verse 14, that, that you have been with Jesus? They looked at Peter and John, saw that they were uneducated, saw that they were guys who, who really uh, were, were kind of simple guys. But one thing they realized, they could tell that they had spent time with Jesus. And I asked, can people tell that I spent time with Jesus? By my conversation, by, by my attitude, by, by the, the expressions of love that come out of my life, by the gratitude that comes out of my life, by, by the sensitivity that comes in, the compassion and the mercy that comes out of my life to other people. Can they tell that I've been with Jesus Christ? We see four things characterized. We're going to go through them very quickly. First of all, a courageous Christian encounters opposition. A courageous counter. When you are willing to express the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word to others, you can expect to face some opposition in this society. Why is that? Because the enemy, Satan, has people deceived and confused and locked up in all kinds of lies. And some of those lies are very religious in their orientation. Talking to people about Jesus Christ is not an easy thing, but when you do, you're going to find out that there are some people who are going to shut you down. They're going to make, uh, uh, they, they may even be rude to you. They may, even, they may even battle you on some front about your Christianity, but you can expect that if you live for Jesus in a culture, in a society that's under the control of Satan, who's in opposing everything that God is about and what God is trying to accomplish, you can expect opposition. Peter and John were involved in a, a very miraculous healing. A man who had been from birth was lame, was crippled. He's 40 years old. He's brought into the temple where he can beg for people to help him make his way in life. And this was the guy that got up walking and leaping and praising God. And there was no way that anyone could refute this miracle. And when they were asked about the power, how did this happen? They acknowledged Jesus Christ as the power that brought this man his legs again and his ability to walk again. And they also proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus from the dead because the disciples very much knew that the good news that people need to hear in life is that the Savior came to die for sins. He was buried, but on the third day, He rose again, conquering death, conquering our greatest enemy, the enemy we fear more than anything. Jesus has defeated. He's defeated it. There's life in His name. There's hope for eternal life through Jesus Christ. And they boldly proclaimed that. But some of the people who heard that message didn't care for that message. They didn't want to hear a message about Jesus rising from the dead. And it's why the Sadducees were very uh, most uh, uh, in opposition to the message. Why? Because the Sadducees didn't believe in a res bodily resurrection. Okay? They didn't believe in that. That was anti to their teaching. So they took notice of it. And you notice, uh, because they couldn't get the tribunal together to put the men on trial, they had to wait another day. You notice some of the names, Caiaphas and, and uh, others that were listed there, some uh, potentially the same people that were present when Jesus was put on trial. And they asked the question, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, Peter could have responded to this question, um, very passively, resigning from really wanting to be controversial. He could have given a, a diplomatic response to appease the crowd, not to ruffle them up. He already knew they were tense. They were, they were upset. They didn't like what they were doing, right? He could have done something to take the tension out of the situation, tell a joke, do something else, right? To, to skirt the issue. But what does he do? He courageously and truthfully answers their question. He affirms the resurrection of Jesus from the dead because it is central to the gospel message of the church. The enemies of the gospel know that 
that the Jesus' resurrection is one element that either proves or disproves the apostles' message. If Jesus remains dead in a tomb, everything that's going on with these disciples is all for nothing. But if Jesus is alive, then everything he ever taught was true. Everything he taught is true. Everything that the apostles were teaching are also true. There's a lot at stake in Jesus rising from the grave. Now you say, just how courageous can you be knowing that the one who, uh, knowing that the one who gave testimony, you're giving testimony to has defeated death. You see the disciples are very courageous. Courageous witnesses encounter opposition because a true uh, witness to the gospel confronts error. You're finding people in erroneous conclusions. Many people who are very religious do not know what this Bible teaches. Many people are willing to take hook, line, and sinker everything that they're told, or they believe bits and pieces of what they've been told, and they don't even check it out to find out if what they've been told is exactly the way it is. And I've always said to every audience before me, don't take it just because I said it. You owe it to yourself to be able to verify for yourself everything that I've said or presented to you in a message as this is the truth of God. Because so many people are lost and going to spend an eternity apart from Christ because they have taken what someone has said and has not verified it. That's true. And this is why the apostles faced opposition. Because they were countering a culture that was very religious and was very bent on achieving a salvation of their own doing, of their own merits, of their own working, which describes many people in culture today, and it could describe someone sitting in this audience this morning. You see, there's only two ways to salvation. There's only two ideas, or, or two ideas presented. There's only one way of salvation. But there are two ideas that, that are presented to people. There is the biblical Christianity that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's called faith righteousness. But there's another one that is, is an opposition, and Paul talks about it in Galatians. There is a work salvation that many people aspire to. Why? Because I can do it. I can earn it. I can do these deeds. I can continue to sort of provide um, my own merits to earn this salvation. If I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I go through these prescribed method methodologies of the church, this is how it happens. But Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, if somehow you could merit your salvation through your good deeds by going to church, reading your Bible, giving in the offering plate, if you could merit a salvation by your good deeds, then Christ died for nothing. You don't need a Savior. You don't need someone to sacrifice their life on the cross for your sin because you can atone for it through your own efforts. And many people are confused because they're sown lots of good works, lots of good deeds. That's how you earn your, your, your favor with God. And somehow you go, how is Jesus in that? Well, he's, he's, he's just a religious figure that they talk about. No, look what... Look what the disciples say. There's salvation in what? No other name. There is no name, other name given among men by which we must be saved. Now, if you say that to people, right, you're going to find out whether they're into a religious, self-righteous, righteous works approach to salvation or really they've committed their life to Jesus Christ. You're going to find that out. And that's what I want to ask you today. Do you believe that there's only salvation, there's only eternal rescue in Jesus Christ and Him alone? There's nothing you can do. There's nothing. The, the, what we do is a result of our salvation, not the basis of our salvation. That's, that's the key to it all. 
And if you preach that and you tell people, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I'm glad you're religious, but your religion is not going to get you any closer to God. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that you enter by faith, trusting that he died on the cross for your sin, that he was buried on the third day, rose according to scripture, and repenting of your sins because you offended God. And you have to acknowledge to God that you've offended him by repenting of your sins. You preach that message, you're going to face some opposition. But you notice, the apostles preach that message, and it says not only do Christians face opposition, courageous Christians, but courageous Christians also experience fruitful results. There are people out there that want to hear this message because they've never heard it before. And the interesting thing about it is they want to hear it from you. They want to hear it from you. People want to hear why Jesus means so much to you. And I ask you, have you ever told somebody why Jesus means so much to you? Do you ever tell people why you get up on Sunday morning and go to church very faithfully? Do you ever tell them why you do that? Notice when Peter and John were were. were, were kind of thrown up against the wall by the, by the council. What did, what did they say? You know, we don't want you to speak anymore in this name. We, we're we're going to intimidate you. We're going to throw all this stuff at you. What did they do? Verse 19 was their response. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, not to speak about Jesus, or, or rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And I tell you, that, that that is a powerful line. What have you seen and heard? What have I seen and heard? What are we telling people that we have seen and heard? Because I have to say, throughout my life, I am very much convicted by this. Because I can be very bold before you this morning, but sometimes I can be not so bold and not so courageous when I'm one-on-one -on -one with a person and sitting down at a table in a conversation and talking to them and starting to inquire about what is the basis of your hope. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ personally? Can I tell you what Jesus Christ has done for me? And I think a lot of us, really struggle on the personal level to really honestly, courageously tell people about why Jesus means what he does to us, why we believe in him, why we've committed our lives to him, why we spend time in our life reading the Bible so that we can get to know God so much better. We can know of his love for us. We can know of his grace for us. We can know of his power that works in our life. We can know of his peace that he gives to us that when we're going through difficult times, we are confident. I got asked that question on, on Thursday at the golf course, like, um, how's this all working for you with your faith? I said, it's working really well. Another guy asked me, do you ever ask God why? Why me? I said, no, I don't. I said, why not me? Who am I? People think there's this little halo that rides on my shoulders everywhere I go. And somehow because I'm a pastor that I get special treatment with God. And I'm telling you, no, if I'm a child of God and you're a child of God, we all get special treatment, don't we? Not just the pastor. God can take my life at any time. I'm immortal until that happens. But heaven is my ultimate goal. That's really where I want to be. With Jesus. And that can happen through sickness. It can happen through cancer. It can happen through an accident. It can happen through any means. God is not at, at, at sort of some obligation to somehow help me for his name because I have cancer. But I do know that he can bring glory to his name if I respond rightly to the questions to tell people, I don't ask God why. Who am I to think that, that I should, should not have to experience that? There are other people who experience things like this in life. 
We all have to go through hardships in life. That's why this world is a world of sin. That's why we need heaven. We need a place where all of the the pain and the sorrow and the, the tears and the sadness and the goodbyes go away. And I can go to Revelation chapter 21 and Jesus says that. There'll be no more tears, no more sorrows, no more goodbyes. No more suffering. No more sorrow. No more losses. No more crying. And I have that through my faith in Jesus Christ. And so many people are lost today. They're living in utter darkness. They're our friends. They're the people we live with. And we need to pray where the Spirit is leading, where the Spirit is is moving in a person's life to throw some things out there once. If they ask you what church you go to, well, I go to Discovery. Why do you go there? What's that, what's that crazy place about an old furniture store, non-denominational? What was that all about? Well, you know, I go there because they've taught me how I can know who Jesus Christ is and that I can have a personal relationship with him. And I don't have to worry about working my way to heaven because Jesus has already provided the way through his death on the cross for my sins. And I've accepted that. And Jesus has changed my life. That's what the disciples are saying. I mean, how can, we, how can we stop from telling people what we've seen and heard? And I wonder, can people stop you from telling them what you have seen and heard? You say, where does the courage come from? Where does the courage come from that these folks on the screen have? Where does that courage come from? There are three sources to this courage. It's a confidence that people have in God. And it's a confidence that's grounded, first of all, in God's power. Do you believe that God has power? We talked about that in Sunday school today, and many of you missed that because you just, I don't know, you just, you're not into Sunday school or you can't get up early enough. I don't know, but if you can't get up early enough, you missed something great this morning because you need to know that your Heavenly Father is called El Shaddai, and He is the Almighty God. There is nothing that He cannot do. And people go through persecution, they go through hardship in life with that confidence that El Shaddai is the almighty God. There is nothing that he cannot do. He is completely sufficient, he is eternal, and I don't have to worry about a thing because he's accomplishing all things according to his purpose and will. These people in, in, on the screen, Peter and John, the early church, accepted persecution. Why? They didn't even pray it away. They prayed for boldness. You would have thought, like an American, they would have been praying, God, take away the persecution. No. You know what they prayed for? Give us boldness. Give us courage. We know, Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. There's going to be persecution. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. They knew that. They didn't even begin to pray that persecution away. They just said, Jesus, give us the strength to be bold. Give us the courage to stand firm when the pressure's on. So it, and that, that confidence comes because you know God is a powerful God. You've seen his power at work in your life. You've seen his power to save you. You've seen his power to, to, to become real in, in, in sustaining you through, through the challenges that you have in life. It's also a confidence that is, that is grounded in God's word. God's word is something that the, the early church saw come to life. You notice in the passage, as you go later on in Acts chapter 4, that Peter and John and the church start quoting from Psalm chapter 2, the second psalm, which is a messianic psalm that, that long before Jesus came, the David prophesied, the psalmist prophesied about Christ's persecution and his, his resurrection and his glory, uh, uh, the glory that he's experiencing now in heaven. And these folks saw this come to light in their day, and they saw that God's word was completely true, that what God says he does, he's completely reliable, and it's because of that they were courageous. 
Do you believe God is true to his word? He's true to his promises. He's going to never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to be with you in the hour of your trial and that he's going to sustain you with his grace, his love, his peace, his patience, his goodness, his, his joy in the midst of all of this. These people believe they stuck with God's word. They stuck with the truth. And I believe that that gives all of us courage as we read God's word. But you have to read it. You have to take time to crack the pages and find the truth and allow the truth to set you free and allow the truth to give you that courage that you need. This word was given to inspire people to be courageous. I look at Joshua, uh, the, the guy that had to take over for old Mo, and Mo was a legend. Moses was a legend. And Moses led the people for 40 years, and now this young guy has, has to now step into Moses' shoes and feel the legend's shoes. And I'm sure the young man was a little bit frightened, and God said, don't be afraid, Joshua. But he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. When you meditate on it day and night, Joshua, when you do what God has, what God has commanded, when you, when you obey, and you're faithful to do everything, God's going to make your way successful and prosperous. You're going to be a spiritual success. You're going to lead your people in a God-honoring way. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. God is going to be with you. He's, going to, he's giving you his promise. He's giving you his presence. And he's also going to show his power through your life. And those are three resources that courageous Christians know that God is going to give them. And that's what makes us courageous. God is going to give me power. A power from on high to endure. God's going to give me his presence. He's going to be with me wherever I go. And God has given me eternal promises that never fail. Do you believe in God and his word? That's how the early church stayed courageous. And finally, the early church stayed courageous because they were confident that God has a plan and purpose. God is not some random, haphazard sort of uh, a God that doesn't know what's going on and just sort of lets things sort of uh, go helter-skelter and crazy uh, in this world. God is working in our day. God is working in Turkey. God is working in Nice, France. God is working in the midst of all these. He's working in the election that's about to get underway, and you need to pray for all that stuff that's going to go on in Cleveland and Philadelphia, all this political maneuvering. We can only pray that our, whoever becomes our next leader will seek out God's face, but even if that president doesn't, that president needs to know that God is in control. Do you believe that God is in control? Do you believe that God has a plan that he's, he's working out and he's going to fulfill it in your life and my life as we trust and wait upon him? That's confidence. That's where the boldness comes from. It's a confidence in God's word, a confidence in God's plans and purposes, and it's also a confidence that God has power and we can trust in him. So the biggest challenge that I wanted to come out of this message today is that, as you saw what the Christians were going through in Iraq, as you saw this young man lose his family because he witnessed. Can you imagine that? My parents, my family died because I was, I was faithful to witness to Jesus Christ. And he was dealing with some guilt. And he said Jesus came and saw him. Jesus spoke to him and said, keep going. And I don't know if you saw the countenance of that young man's face. There was joy in that face. As he's ministering to people, and as they're going through persecution, he's saying, people are coming up to us and they're saying... Hey, whatever, what about this? They want our Bibles so that we can, they can read them. They, they are seeing there's such a stark difference between the, the, the Muslim religion that they've been committed to that is very dark and very depressing and has no hope and the life of these Christians who live with complete confidence and hope. And my prayer for me as I watch this this morning, is God, make me bolder. Give me more courage to inquire about people where they stand spiritually, about their eternal destiny, if they know where that is. 
give me, give me the sensitivity, Lord, to know where you're working in someone's life and where you're not. That I don't, need to, I don't need to barge into somebody's life if they're resistant, if they're, they're hostile. I, I don't need to go there. But at the same time, give me the sensitivity to know that even through my illness, even through whatever uh, the, the brings up the conversation, Lord, you can give me the, the wisdom and the strength and the courage to ask people, are you ready to die? Are you ready to face your eternity? Do you know that Jesus came to die for your sins? That he came to rescue you from hell and sin and death and eternal separation from God. Jesus came to graciously do that and provide every one of us a rescue. And not only a rescue, he came to give us life. Life. There's life in his name. Are you experiencing that life today, Christian? Can people see that life in you? Can they see it in me? Can they see the strength to rise above... Or do they see that I'm so wrapped up around the axles in everything that's going on in this world? I'm so tied up. I'm so frustrated because my life is so, so much wrapped around this, this rat race of a, of, of a society that's so into materialism, so into, so into self and everything else that goes with that. And you see what it's doing to our society. It's, 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 it's destroying It's destroying families, destroying relationships, making people angry and hostile. Do you have that peace within your life? The peace that Jesus wants to bring you today? Or are you constantly striving and constantly just on edge? Folks, can we agree that we need to bring to a world in great need, a world that's in confusion, some powerful love and powerful grace and powerful mercy and powerful kindness that we've received in Jesus. Are we taking time to abide with Jesus so that people can really tell that Jesus does make a difference in my, in my life? Jesus is the master of my life. Jesus is leading me to heaven The Bible has many pictures of courage. People who are willing to sacrifice their lives. I remember one missionary who died, gave his life. The Aka Indians in Ecuador, Jim Elliott, said, He is no fool. He is no fool. To lose that which he, not, which he cannot keep. To lose that which he cannot keep. To gain that which he cannot lose. There have been many martyrs for the gospel who were willing to say, I believe, I trust what this says, and I'm going to be courageous because I want to enter, he enter heaven on a courageous note, knowing that I stood for Jesus Christ, that I was faithful to him and my commitment to him all the way to the end, that I yielded to his power and grace working in me through his spirit and he used me in my life to make a difference in someone else's life. Because you know what? There's no greater joy that comes to any of our life but seeing someone saved, right? I love when people come to Jesus Christ. And I pray that someone here today would embrace Jesus as their Savior today. Father, I pray for holy boldness that you would... Uh, you would put boldness and courage into our lives. Lord, that we, that courage would be grounded, Lord, in, in you and your promises. Lord, in the fact that you are God and you are great and you are powerful. Lord, I pray that that courage would be based on the fact that we have confidence, God, that you're in control, you're sovereign, you're Lord over all. I mean, we sang that, Jesus, Lord of all. We realize what that means. That means, Jesus, you're in control of all. You're, you're, you have a plan to accomplish, and because of it, we rest in that. Lord, I'm thankful that you have a plan and purpose for my life. You have a plan and purpose for cancer in my life. And Lord, I'm going to let you accomplish that. I don't want to stand in your way. And I, I pray that in all of our situations, however difficult or dark they might be, Lord, 
you will make your plans and purposes known to us so that we can relay to others how what we've seen, what we've heard of how Jesus, how good he is, and how everyone needs to have a relationship with him. And I pray that if there's someone here today that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they would either seek me out, seek someone out to, to understand that, or that they would pray in their hearts to confess their sins, and to come and acknowledge, Jesus, I need you to save me because I know I can't do it myself. Lord, I give you thanks, and I praise you in Jesus' name.